A meteor containing alien life that can evolve super fast crashes into the Earth. Can humans stop them from dominating the world? Let's find out in the movie. In the middle of the night, an aspiring fireworker named Wayne Gray goes into a barren desert to practice for his practical exam the next day, when suddenly he notices a meteor coming to crash in his direction. Wayne runs as fast as he can to get away, but his car is already wrecked by the impact. The next morning, at Glen Canyon Community College, a science professor named Harry Block receives a call about the meteor crash and takes the opportunity to examine the meteorite firsthand. Tagging along with him is his friend and also another science professor named Dr. Ira Kane. At the crash site, Harry shows his ID to the sheriff, saying that he's the official representative of the U.S. Geological Survey. After questioning Wayne about what happened last night, Harry asks the sheriff about the crater. Going through a tunnel system, Harry and Ira finally reach the cavern where the meteorite is in and proceed to get rock samples. Back in Ira's lab at the university, he checks the liquid that came from the rock while Harry goes to watch the game of his volleyball team. And to Ira's surprise, the liquid from the meteorite turns out to contain single-celled organisms which are multiplying at a very fast rate. Seeing this, Ira runs a test on his computer and discovers that the cell's DNA has 10 base pairs. Comparing it to all of Earth's living creatures' DNA, which only has four base pairs, this proves the existence of alien life. He quickly goes to the gym and tells Harry about it. Hearing this, Harry immediately thinks of getting a Nobel Prize for their discovery. However, as they go to Ira's office, where he transferred the sample, they are amazed to witness that the single-celled organisms have evolved into multicellular organisms. Later, the two return to the crash site with their students, saying that it's a field and expedition trip. Ira also reminds them not to touch or move anything, especially without their protective gloves. Down in the cavern, Ira and Harry are in shock to see that there is already plant life around the meteorite and a foul smell in the area, which Ira refers to as ammonia and methane, assuming that they are already creating their own atmosphere. At this time, one of Harry's students, Nadine, feels something wiggling on her toes. Upon clearing the fog below them, they discover that they are all stepping on millions of flat worms. Disgusted, the students quickly get out of the pit full of worms. Ira picks one flatworm up, which suddenly dies as it is exposed to oxygen. Therefore, he believes that for this alien life to live, they must be under their own atmosphere at all times, and orders Harry to grab some of the alien's makeshift atmosphere so they can study the worms without them dying. Later, at the university, the two professors find in astonishment that the alien worms, which are dividing itself into two, reproducing by multiplying themselves like mitosis. On their way back to Ira's office, he reminds Harry not to tell anyone, especially the government, about their discovery for the time being. Meanwhile, the lack of sleep has caused Wayne to lose focus and fail his practical exam. He is currently working as a pool manager at the country club, where he discovers several dead flatworms leading inside the storage. Wayne grabs a bleach, planning to kill the worms using it. Then, all of a sudden, he notices that something is moving in the water tank. And to his horror, he sees a weird-looking animal inside, which goes straight to the pump. Having no idea what it is, Wayne just decides to leave. The next day, Ira and Harry go to the crash site, only to find that it has been taken over by the military. At the entrance, they are stopped by a soldier, saying that they're not on the list of allowed visitors, but Ira asks him if they can talk with his superior. Not long after, Ira and Harry are permitted to enter and are instructed to go straight to the command tent. There, Ira is greeted by General Russell Woodman. To Harry's surprise, it is revealed that Ira was a former colonel that worked in the Pentagon with Russell. Ira asks how did Russell know about the meteorite, and he casually reveals that they have been monitoring Ira's computer this whole time, and he is kind of disappointed that Ira didn't tip them about the meteorite. At this moment, a woman joins the conversation, saying that Ira should have also informed the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention about it. Seeing her, 
Russell introduces her as Dr. Allison Reed, a senior researcher in epidemiology at CDC. Subsequently, Russell thanks Ira and Harry for their discovery and tells them that the military and CDC will take it from here on. Stunned, Ira says they deserve to continue their research, but Russell just points out that he is a disgrace and a dangerous researcher. The two professors then angrily say they will fight for their rights and see them in court. Two weeks later, Ira and Harry face Russell and Allison in court in hopes of continuing their research of the meteorite, pointing out that they are the first to discover alien life and all the documented evidence is at Ira's office at the university. In turn, Allison questions Ira at the witness stand about the incident that he caused when he tried to make a vaccine for anthrax. As it turns out, Ira was dismissed from service after his experimental vaccines caused horrible side effects to the soldiers that received them. The side effects consist of severe diarrhea, memory loss, temporary blindness, and so on, which are even called by the soldiers cane madness. With all of that laid out, Ira and Harry lose the case. To make matters worse, they find out that Ira's office had been ransacked and all their research and documented evidence were stolen. Because of this, they decide to fight fire with fire. Posing as soldiers, Ira and Harry sneak into the research facility and make their way down to the cavern, trying to gather another specimen. There, they are amused to see how much the environment has changed. The place has now a completely formed environment full of alien life, both animals and plants. Shortly after, Harry steps into one of the alien insects and the smaller ones start gathering to eat it. Seeing this, Ira orders Harry to grab one of the little aliens and put it in the container. When he is about to get one of them, a much bigger alien suddenly steps on it and eats it. Looking at the back of the alien, Harry reminds it of Allison's behind and starts jesting, saying that women like Allison just need a little love so they would soften. Unknown to them, the place has a microphone so Allison can hear them from the command center. Due to that, Allison, along with two more military officers, goes down the cavern and threatens to have them arrested for violating court orders. In turn, Ira mocks her for her audacity to say such things since they were the first ones who stole all of Ira's documents. Hearing this, Allison gets confused, saying that she doesn't know what he's talking about. When Ira insists that her military friends did it, a fly-like alien suddenly tears Harry's suit and gets inside. Thinking quickly, Allison orders Ira to turn up the oxygen level to kill the fly. However, it gets inside Harry's butt. They then immediately bring Harry to the operating room inside the facility. As the alien moves up near his thing, the doctor suggests pulling the insect out of Harry by using forceps. Harry protests at first, yet he has no other choice when Ira and Allison force him to flip. And after a few minutes, the doctor finally removes the insect from his body. Meanwhile, at the country club, Wayne is now working as a server during a party. At this time, the arrogant owner of the country club sees a beautiful woman and invites her for a drink outside, but accidentally spills some wine on his pants. Annoyed, he washes it on a nearby lake. Then all of a sudden, the owner gets attacked and mauled by a crocodile-like alien, killing him. The woman sees everything and rushes back to the party, telling everyone what she saw. The next day, Ira and Harry find Wayne waiting for them outside Ira's office. Inside, Wayne shows them the crocodile-like alien, saying that this animal killed the owner of the country club. According to him, he and the others chased the animal, but when it stepped on a sand trap, it just died. At the same time, elsewhere, a group of middle-aged women discovers a weird frog-like alien. When one of them takes a closer look, the alien opens its mouth, revealing a terrifying second chicken-like head attached to its mouth and bites the woman. Shocked, one of them calls 911 while the other one gets a gun. But before she can even shoot, it quickly dies as it grasps for air. Concurrently, Ira comes to Allison's hotel to talk to her, warning her that the aliens are spreading and adapting quickly to Earth's atmosphere. And she needs to convince Russell to kill all of the aliens while they still can. Without promising a likable outcome for him, Allison says she will try to discuss it with the general. When she gets into the elevator, Ira suddenly asks if there's a chance for her to like him. Hearing this, Allison just laughs it off. 
After that, Ira meets with Harry and Wayne at a diner where he tells them that he has convinced Allison to talk to Russell. Wayne takes the opportunity to ask the two professors if what is happening is some kind of alien attack. But Harry and Wayne are not sure as well. Then, they hear on a nearby police officer's radio the call about what happened to a group of middle-aged women who discovers a weird frog-like alien. With the address they hear from the call, the three head there to do their own investigation. After convincing the police officer, whom they know from the crash site before, Ira and Harry enter the house while Wayne checks on the back. Inside, they check where the alien might have come from and discover that it dug its way to the house's storage room. Not a moment later, Wayne arrives and shows them a bunch of half-dyed dragon-like aliens at the back of the house. The three inspect the aliens and Ira thinks that they are trying to breathe oxygen like they're learning to adapt. Thinking about it carefully, Harry realizes that all of the aliens come from the cavern, which is basically a honeycomb of caves and old mine shafts. From the cavern, many tunnels lead to the outer part of town and the aliens are using those to travel without getting detected. When suddenly, they notice that one alien is still moving and is vomiting something. But as it turns out, the alien is giving birth to another dragon-like creature. And unfortunately for them, this one can breathe oxygen. With the birth of the first alien that can breathe oxygen, the three realize that they're now in big trouble. As the alien flies to the mall, Ira, Harry, and Wayne quickly follow it. Arming themselves with guns, they hunt the alien, which takes a shoplifter hostage. As the alien flies past them, Ira decides to take the second floor while Harry and Wayne stay on the ground floor to widen their area of search. However, they still lose sight of the alien and the shoplifter. Suddenly, Wayne sings and the alien seems to be attracted to it as it makes its way back to them. Knowing this, he keeps on singing and when the timing is right, Harry snatches the shoplifter from the alien. Ira then takes the opportunity to shoot it down. As they check on the body, it starts moving again so the three shoot it again for a double tap. This incident finally calls the attention of the media and the alien attacks are now being made public. Due to that, Governor Lewis storms into the crash site and demands Russell to explain the situation to him. But the general blames the situation on Ira and Harry, saying that since they breached the facility, all hell breaks loose. Allison tries to defend the two professors, yet Russell just dismisses her. Just then, Ira, Harry, and Wayne arrive, and it immediately sparks a blaming game between them and Russell. Pissed, Lewis stops them, stating that he doesn't care who or what started it. All he wants is a way to eradicate the aliens, given how bad the situation is. Russell immediately claims that he has already devised a plan. According to him, after executing the people of Glen Canyon, they will use napalm to burn the aliens and the cavern where the meteorite landed. But their briefing is interrupted when one of Russell's men alerts him that an alien just broke one of the cameras in the cavern. To their horror, it shows on the monitor that some of the aliens evolved as primates and are sabotaging the cameras. They immediately get into position, ready to protect the governor and fight the aliens. A fight ensues between humans and primates. When the soldiers get busy protecting themselves, they don't notice that one of the primates already attacks Lewis. Ira and Harry try to help him, but the alien's skin is too tough. Picking up the gun nearby, Wayne shoots it and manages to kill the primate. Before escaping the scene, Lewis gives Russell the consent to enact his plan and wipe out the aliens once and for all. When the governor is gone, Russell orders Ira to take his friends and leave as well. Just then, Allison tells Russell that he's a jerk and she is leaving with Ira and the others. Outside, she gives Ira all his stolen research files and original samples so he will be properly credited if they manage to solve the alien problem. As the evacuation happens, the four travel to the university trying to think of a way to kill the alien. Stressed, Harry lights up a cigarette and throws the still-burning match to the liquid specimen that Allison gets back for them. Suddenly, dormant cells grow exponentially as it reacts to fire. At this time, they realize that burning the cavern will only worsen the situation as it will wake up all the dormant and unevolved cells inside, which means using napalm to burn the aliens will be the worst idea. 
The evolved cell in the lab immediately dies in exposure to oxygen, but they are not sure if it will be the case for those in the cavern. Because of that, Allison tries to call Russell, who doesn't pick it up. At this moment, Ira notices the periodic table on the back of Allison's shirt and comes up with a hypothesis. Tracing the element that is harmful to humans, he uses the same formula and traces the elements of what could be harmful to the aliens. To humans that are carbon-based life forms, arsenic is very poisonous. Now to the aliens that are nitrogen-based life forms, Ira thinks that selenium will be their poison and 500 gallons of selenium might be enough to kill the aliens. Hearing this, Wayne says he can borrow a fire truck where they can store and weaponize the element which can be found in head and shoulders, a shampoo that uses selenium sulfide as an ingredient. With everything set up, they all move out and prepare for the mission. Morning comes and all the students just finished loading all the shampoos in the fire truck. Then they head out to another entrance to the cavern, meaning to arrive before Russell executes his plan. Meanwhile, Russell's troop is also preparing to burn the aliens. And to Russell's surprise, Lewis shows up saying that he wants to watch the whole process. Because of this, the schedule of the burning is moved early. Going back inside the cavern, Ira orders Wayne to go back and wait for his command to activate the hose. Then, they move carefully near the meteor, but the primates spot them. Seeing them, Ira orders Wayne to turn on the hose. But the bombing has already begun, and this throws off the plan of Ira's group. As the flame reaches the dormant cells, it starts growing into a gigantic blob-like creature that eats every living being on its way. Lewis and Russell are slapped by the truth when they finally see the blob-like creature growing out of the cave system. The soldiers try to fire at the alien, but bullets don't affect it at all. Realizing their mistake, Russell orders for retreat. In the meantime, while quickly running back to the fire truck, Ira notices that the creature is now beginning to split itself into two. With humanity on the line, the group decides to continue their plan to use shampoo against the alien. Driving underneath it, they find its butthole and target the alien from there. Using the fire truck's ladder, Ira and Harry go near it and fire the shampoo inside. Then, all of a sudden, Harry gets sucked inside. Luckily, Ira gets a hold of him and pulls him out in time. With enough shampoo fired inside the alien, the creature starts to get bloated and the group immediately drives away. A little later, the blob-like alien explodes and the group shouts victoriously. As they celebrate, Ira and Allison kiss. After the incident, Lewis gets interviewed and proudly shares in the media that they use locally produced shampoo to defeat the alien. Then, he introduces Harry and Wayne as local heroes to the public. When it's Ira's and Allison's turn to be introduced, the two sneak out to spend some time together. The movie ends with Ira, Harry, and Wayne starring in a head and shoulder commercial. Evolution shows a great amount of humor, but still manages to balance it with all the scientific parts of the plot. Also, by presenting different aliens each time, the audience will never get bored watching the characters deal with them. It's like playing a role-playing game where you face different monsters before going against the final boss. Overall, this movie doesn't fail to deliver what is promised to the audience.